Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Vijay Gurbhaksani. I'm the director of the Center for Digital Transformation, a center of excellence at the Paul Mirad School of Business. Um, we're delighted to be back in action. This is our first live event after we postponed the conference in March due to, of course, as everybody knows, COVID-19. Uh, and we are delighted that so many of you could join us today. We have over 300 people signed up for this event. And, and it's really heartwarming uh, to see sort of the interest and the activities uh, we put on. So thank you very much for your support and thank you very much for joining us. Um, this, is a, this is what we're calling our Digital Leadership Series event. Uh, and we're absolutely privileged and honored to be able to feature Susan Doniz, who is the VP of IT and Analytics and the Chief Information Officer at Boeing. Uh, she's been a longtime friend and a supporter of the center. In fact, she's on our advisory board and has spoken uh, on, at our conference twice. And so we, would, we began to think about who we would like to kick this event off with, and we couldn't think of anybody better than Susan. Uh, Susan's an accomplished executive. She's been uh, at a variety of big companies, including Qantas, P&G, SAP, and Air Canada, and is now at the Boeing Company. She brings a wealth of experience uh, to her role and a lot of ex expertise and experience to share with us. Uh, the, the theme of today's session is building resilience in uncertain times. And having taught in a business school as long as I have, I don't think I've heard the word resilience used as often as we've been using it in the last month or two. And you know, we've talked about business continuity, but really not about resilience. And sort of the poster child for resilience is actually universities who sort of switched from in-person education to online education inside two weeks in a lot of cases. Uh, but we're not here to talk about us. We're here to talk about Boeing and Susan and what she can share with us. Uh, so let's just um, welcome Susan first. So Susan, thank you so much for taking the time to join us at this event. Nowadays, taking the time means turning off one Zoom call and joining us on the next Zoom call without really going too far. But thank you again. Uh, appreciate your being with us. Um, all right, so let's just get right to it. I don't know very many people who've actually switched such, switch roles to take on a role of such responsibility during the pandemic. I uh, know a couple of other people, but you're the first person I've actually, I'm, I have the honor of speaking to you live about this. So your first day of work was when the pandemic was well underway. That's a tough environment to walk into. What were the first things you, you thought about as you moved into your new role? Well, I mean, one of the things that, one of the first questions I got um, from people as I joined and also as it was announced is just around the timing and the challenges. And I have to say my response to all of that is, is this is the best time I could have possibly joined Boeing because firstly, it's a great group of, pe a very smart group of people, but it's also a time where people are humble and they're willing to hear uh, what a person who has not spent, you know, many, many years at Boeing has to say. And it's a time when people want to hear different things and want to uh, change. And it's also a time when decisions are being made very quickly. Um, so I think that one of the things that I looked at when I came in is as you come in, you know, the hurdles when you are virtually onboarding are, are much, much higher. Uh, because I've been at the Boeing company over just over 30 days now, and I have not stepped foot in any location yet, nor have I seen anybody um, at all in the company. So imagine, you know, starting um, with everything being virtual, especially in a, in a company where there's manufacturing as a key component of it. So there, there's that challenge. There's the challenge of, you know, difficulty accessing information. Where's all the information? And then the, the third challenge for me was around how do you build rapport with people and how do they feel connected to me as a new leader and them and I to them? Um, and then the anxiety. So you already look at the anxiety of COVID. You look at the anxiety of a, of a stressed industry in terms of travel, et cetera, right now. Um, and then you look at a new leader coming in where people naturally will feel anxious about it. So some of the things that I did, I would say, is I overcompensated for that by talking to a lot of people and overcompensating in terms of responding. So 
anybody, the wonderful thing about Boeing is um, people will reach out to you from, you know, any layer or any place in the organization. And I made sure that I personally responded to every single one of them. So I didn't have a ghostwriter. I read the emails. I responded to them because it, it was a two-way street. One, it was a way for me to have radical transparency, but it was also a way for them to understand what was on my mind. So that's the other thing I did is you know, posting on blogs, speaking as often as I can, telling them what I'm working on, um, and finding ways to connect, um, I think is really, really critical. Uh, the other thing I did is I would pick up the phone. So um, that's the other piece is decision making is very quick um, during this time, which is when you think about it, you know, that's great. Um, but it doesn't give you as much time for formal meetings or to wait till you've gotten, you know, your full deep dives is you have to pick up the phone and ask for people's opinion. And I've been doing that a lot. And I actually found that's a really great way to find and create these connections with people is just picking up the phone and talking to them and not asking just one person for their opinion is asking uh, several people for their opinion. Because again, you have to draw yourself a mental map um, and a picture of that for yourself. And you do that by putting, you know, different pieces of the pie together. So it's been challenging, but I have to say, you know, the organization has been tremendous. Everybody has really leaned forward in helping me um, come up to speed and really sharing with me all their knowledge. I'll, I'll respond to you in a second. But before that, I, I forgot to mention that uh, we will take questions and answers at the end of this session with the, in the last 10 minutes. We're not going to be using the chat function or the raising your hand function. We're going to be taking questions through the Q&A function through the webinar. It's at the bottom of your screen, so please uh, get, uh, get ready to use that when we're about 15 minutes out of uh, winding up. Uh, so Susan, actually getting back to what you just said, um, it's fascinating because a lot of these things are just sort of basic management principles that we forgot about, not necessarily literally forgot about, but we just got so busy that we stopped doing many of those things. One of the things we talk about even at the center with this little organization that we have is a lot, you know, instantly everything fell off our calendar. And, you know, we began approaching this with some thought about what do we want to let back in because we were just running on this treadmill. And I, I can only imagine what it must be like in Boeing, but sort of, you know, soliciting a lot of opinions from people not just because you knew, even if you were there for a while, is really important, but we get so used to sort of the social networks and the business networks that we have, that we actually don't emphasize that as much as we should. You know, we find that too, even on a Zoom call, uh, when we teach a class, we can see sort of, we get better participation and better comments. I shouldn't say better in quality necessarily, but wider participation because people see each other as equal on a screen and you don't have sort of any dominant personalities necessarily that uh, can, they can sort of hog the limelight, if you will. So, so, the, so let's sort of dig into a lot of what you sort of uh, alluded to already. Uh, so when you got there, you know, most of the workforce was, as you said, already home, um, but the manufacturing facilities are not quite just, I've been reading that some of them are closed, but I'm not sure if all of them are closed or whether you resume manufacturing. Uh, so, so how do you sort of, so there's the first question of how do you maintain, how do you ensure business continuity, making sure people can work from home, making sure factories can work. Uh, and I'm sure there's a lot of things that I don't know about that Boeing does, especially on the defense side, perhaps. Yeah, so, so firstly, I mean, I think what really resonates with me is kind of what you said is as, as I looked at some of the things that I did to onboard, as you said, there are just good management practices. Like this makes me a better leader at the end of the day. Right. Um, and it's not because of COVID, it actually just forced me to do it, um, which I, th I think is a really good practice in terms of, you know, as we get through all of this, you know, we don't want to go back to our old ways of working. We really want to be in this more connected way, um, whether we're on site or off site. Um, so just in terms of, uh, you know, business continuity is firstly, I must uh, not lose this opportunity to call out that absolutely fabulous work um, that my team did in getting from one day to the other, we went from 15,000 being offsite to literally 90,000 people working from home with basically little disruption at all. 
um, and going from one to the other. Uh, you know, obviously, um, as people are in the factories, there's still some people that need to work, but there's been a tremendous amount of work done to make sure that the employees are safe um, and that they're taken care of um, as well. And I think a lot of that has to do with, uh, you know, muscle memory, so to speak, which is also known as business continuity, which is yep. you don't just write things down on a piece of paper. I mean, the best way to prepare for these things is to try them. Um, and make sure you have them. So a lot of what we did was um, making sure that we had these plans and were able to surface them. Now, having said that, of course, nobody might, or, or you know, maybe a few companies had looked at having everybody at home. Um, certainly there were some companies that I came into contact with that had, you know, do all sorts of modeling around their manufacturing and supply chain uh, to do that. But certainly uh, at this scale was probably a bit uh, different. And I think you know, at least what I've heard from my fellow colleagues and CIOs and technology leaders is this happened almost everywhere. So, you know, my hat's off to the technology industry as a whole, um, people working within the companies and all of you supporting us too. I mean, it was amazing um, the way we were able to go from, you know, small to, you know, these huge numbers so quickly. Um, and then other things that we had to do too, which was how do you respond to things very quickly? Because um, in all the companies I know, Boeing, Qantas, and everybody else that you've all been working on too, is you had to closely work with your vendors on how you can scale up this as quickly yep. as possible. You had to look at um, all sorts of little apps and things we created in terms of understanding where people are, contact tracing. Um, it was really uh, amazing how we really looked at these things and were able to turn things around um, quite quickly. Um, and so I think that a lot of what you do, even when I was at Qantas, you know, how do you run um, these incidents quite quickly? I mean, we were able to stand up teams quite literally um, from one hour to the other, because as you know, at the beginning, as this all unfolded, um, you know, countries were coming up with their, the rules kind of as you went. And so people were boarding planes and you had to have some clarity around some things. So there was really a lot of work that had been done before that to understand how do we stand up teams? How do we communicate? How do we get decisions done quickly? You know, I think those are really interesting because one of the things you alluded to, but is really important is, you know, we at the center interface with a lot of chief information officers. And I haven't heard of the single failure yet. I'm sure there's some hiccups here and there, but every single company that I've spoken to managed to stand up its entire organization in a brand new modality and so hats off to sort of the professionalism of the CIO community that's been uh, able to pull that off. Um, sort of one of the things we sort of don't think about enough when you mention this uh, as, you know, as pertains to Qantas, but it's also true of Boeing is sort of globalization and sort of keeping track of different countries at different uh, places on the curve of COVID-19 and different practices about how we address safety. That's a heck of a challenge to keep track of. And I guess what you're saying is that, you know, these companies did manage to pull that off. Uh, okay. Um, one of the things that we also learned talking about resilience still is that a lot of companies were actually, so yes, they were able to send people, able to enable people to work from home, uh, but did struggle a little more with resilience, for example, in the following way, because for those of us who've been around IT for a long time, a lot of resilience was defined in terms of business continuity plans and invariably incorporated uh, geographic diversity. So which is, you know, uh, region A goes down, you've got, you're backed up in region B and so on. But this is one of those rare occasions when sort of so many regions and countries sort of went, uh, we're hit at the same time and there's a rolling pattern of sort of what's going on. How do you think about uh, so the short version, the, sh the, sort of the short summary is that is many companies were not resilient to sort of a, a, a huge shock like this one. In your new role at Boeing, how do you think about sort of the future and building sort of more resilience into a company like Boeing? Well, I think of resilience as um, one of the key capabilities and tools for success in the 21st century is when you think about, you know, and you're in the education field, so you'll know this better than I do, is, 
you know, sometimes it's not about the programming language that you're using or the cloud technology that you're um, using or the security. Sometimes it's about these capabilities that underlie it. So this capability to learn new things. But the other capability for me that, um, you know, I set my hats off for the whole technology function and profession is this idea of resilience. Because when you think about technology, I mean, the stuff in the programming languages I learned in university are completely different than now. And, I, you know, I don't know what the life cycle of most programming languages are, but I'm certain they're not more than a few years, or certainly there's new skills that are required. So as a technology profession, I think that we are the function that is most prepared for resilience because we constantly have to reinvent ourselves as professionals and to keep on top of things to be able to know um, and to be able to perform in our function. When I was at PNG, they used this um, really great um, terminology and I think it came from the army, it was called VUCA, um, which was volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. And they used it to describe the world that we were moving to. And, you know, I think of it as a perfect, you know, explanation of, of resilience and why we need it and why it's a key tool is in this kind of environment, in order to succeed, you have to be able to deal with things that are volatile, that are changing all the time, things that are uncertain. We don't know uh, the different futures. So that means you have to be able to change quickly and not get too married to things, but also to have the objectivity to understand when things are changing. And then the, the, the third piece, which is the complexity, which you referred to um, as well, VJ, and, and you know, different countries and different, um, different curves and how you keep track of that all. And that's obviously what technology and the computer have all tried to do is to help us um, deal with all this complexity. And the ambiguous is, again, is you're not going to have all the information and I think that's one of the things that I learned at PNG too, is how to make decisions when you don't have all the information, but you know you need to make a decision because sometimes not making a decision is making a decision. So you mm -hmm. kind of have to you know, move forward constantly. Um, and I, I think the other thing around resilience is knowing as much as you can and being able to plan for that because at least you're not going to have 15 balls in the air. Maybe you'll have five balls in the air that you're juggling, but at least, you know, you've got 10 of them that you have a good handle on. Um, I referred to before, you know, I met with one of our uh, suppliers, which had a really um, great way they looked at kind of all of these events. And what they did is they built out all these models to be able to understand how could they move manufacturing from one place to another, kind of at the, the drop of a dime. Um, in order to do this. So I think that's what resilience means to me. Yeah, and there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of commentary in the business press about sort of productivity and efficiency on the one hand versus resilience. And I would speculate here because there's not a lot of good data yet, but it seems to me that we've emphasized productivity and efficiency. Uh, and you know, certainly in certain industries that were far more resilient than others, but uh, it seems to me that sort of we need to move the balance a little more towards resilience because we, I mean, reasonably didn't anticipate a shock like this one. Uh, though people have been warning about it for a while, but you know, it's very difficult to keep investing for, you know, um, sort of this black swan type event. Um, but uh, the other thing that you said, which I thought was particularly sort of important, is sort of investing in capabilities that give you, give you resilience. Uh, because you don't really know what's going to happen. So you sort of have to have a prepared workforce that sort of, you know, has the, the core competencies and the capabilities that they need. You know, from a digital perspective in your new role, and, and I also believe I should say that, you know, managing in uncertain times, managing a global company, uh, technology is a big piece of the answer because obviously you refer to the cloud, you refer to work from home, all of these things are technology enabled, uh, automation can help. Um, and then sort of you confront a situation where you've got all of these different initiatives already in place. Uh, you know, these things that you're working on, things that are in the pipeline, things that you're seeking approval for. What's sort of the overarching set of principles if there, they exist, but or even a broad set of guidelines as to what do I want to keep doing? What do I want to keep investing in? What do I stop? You know, what's going to be useless in the future? Uh, how do you think about that? 
Yeah, I, I again, I kind of go back to a bit this whole lesson for me around this whole COVID situation, situation we're in is that a lot of what it's, it's forced us to do, what we always said we would be doing, but it's kind of holding us to account for it because you can't get away with not doing it, which is, you know, this importance of being agile. We've been talking about agile and agile practices and technology for a long time. So when you look at an agile practice, the, the idea is you're every week, you're looking at the feature sets you're about to do and you're being held to account in terms of outcomes versus necessarily just the feature set. So you, the idea is for Agile is you're supposed to be constantly replanning um, and doing it very quickly. So the, you know, the theory would go, if you really had an Agile process, you know, this should be just, you know, you just put in uh, different uh, inputs um, to the outputs that you need. And, you know, that's part of the process that you have already. So, but I think it's back to kind of the transparency in terms of, what's on the next week's plan. You know, one of the things um, that we did at Qantas that I thought was really helpful is we looked at the projects that got big results early. So which ones had in year payback? You know, that's a really important thing as you look at the COVID, which one brings in value earlier in the process? So as an example, we oftentimes in technology would look at a huge project. It might take us 18 months to do. Again, if you go to the agile principle, the idea is you, you should be developing and delivering value at every release. And those releases should be done, you know, biweekly, you know, at, at a very regular and quick pace. So if you look at that, then you have to, and you're forced to look at, actually, when you look at this overall program and project, what is the piece that actually brings the most value? And you're forced, forced to make those um, decisions to say, actually, that one piece that doesn't go in until the very end, because I thought I had to have all these things in place, I can bring it in earlier. The other thing it's forced us to do in terms of this is, you know, the Pareto principle, which is, you know, this whole idea of simplifying solutions, which is, um, you know, instead of asking for the 80% of stuff you need is what if you just looked at 20% of the features that bring in 80% of the value. So a lot of that was work that we did, for example, you can do that with robotic process automation. I'm sure a lot of the people on the call here have experience with that is sometimes you don't need to implement these huge mega programs, but you can actually put in an analytics report um, or put in a robotic process automation that does that in, in, you know, and you set that up in days. And that's what we did for the contact tracing at Boeing, also with Qantas in terms of, um, making sure people could um, change their flights very quickly because of the help desk. You know, you put in these little things quickly and that helps you fund some of the other things that you want to do longer term. So I think that there's a lot more focus on what Agile really should have been and really is um, now in this COVID uh, situation. Yeah, you're touching on something which we've talked about and I actually wrote about, um, you know, which is, We've known some of this stuff already, and we sort of just weren't doing them as well. Um, and you know, so Agile, for example, has long been seen as a software development uh, approach. But increasingly, I think we're finding that this works well throughout the company. We should be thinking about Agile decision making, Agile projects, whether in technology or not. But it sort of does get, also get to the question of what capabilities do you have in place? Um, you know, I think it's sort of really interesting because uh, I think it was Milton Friedman who said something, and I don't remember the exact quote, but sort of, you know, time of crisis, you look for the ideas you already have, you leverage the ideas that are already in place. And we find that at the university because there's been a range of outcomes uh, in terms of how well we did with the move to online learning. One of my colleagues just told me last week, for example, that his grandchildren, who are actually at Premier University, I'll just leave it at that, uh, watched him teach online and found that Mirage was doing a much better job than these expensive universities they were at. And the reason for that is we've been, as, as a business school, been doing sort of hybrid and online education for a while now. So we were ready to scale it up. It was still tricky. But those capabilities were in place. We, you know, some of the faculty, not all, knew how to do it. The technology existed. We had the instructional designers and the studios, everything in place. Um, and I think 
sort of the question really is what sort of digital capabilities are you investing in today that will give you sort of the ability to deal with uncertainty? So you alluded to um, agile, but I suspect there's cloud and other things that you're thinking about that, um, you know, we don't know when the next, that's a new buzzword of kind of being the next normal. We don't know what it is and we don't know when it's going to be here. So what do you do today in terms of building capabilities? Yeah. Well, first I have to say I've been absolutely blown away by the technology capabilities that Boeing has shown me over the last uh, 30 plus days that I've been there. I mean, just things in terms of prediction tools that look at and are able to uh, understand objects and see where the debris is, you know, flying patterns and the AI around that. I don't know if any of you, uh, you know, being able to look into an airplane and figuring out the wiring. I mean, in the past, they would have, you know, 2D drawings, you know, imagine um, trying to figure out how the wires need to go when you have a 2D rendering of what you're doing. So we've installed some um, product lifecycle management tools that allow you to do 3D renderings and allow you to look at the plane in different ways. Um, so I, these are all important tools, but then you also referred to kind of the underlying, I'll call it infrastructure as well. So in the past, when you had a lot of this data, you know, you might be able to do it, but you kind of have to go, you know, make yourself some coffee, come back, then make yourself some lunch, come back. Um, but really, a lot of the work that's been done too is the platform or the infrastructure to allow you to run all these very complex algorithms and capabilities uh, very, very quickly in real time, which is also what's needed, you know, back to the VUCA and the volatile and the quick um, change is how do you allow yourself to build these capabilities so you can run them at, you know, a really quick speed and to make things elastic, which is a little bit of what we've done as well as you think about going from, you know, 15,000 um, workers from home to 90,000 workers from home is you're able to scale these things up very quickly, but also scale them down as well. So I think that there's, you know, the, the, you know, the, the front facing capabilities, so to speak, like the AI and the prediction and all this, the different um, technologies and the robotics, but there's also the underlying uh, edge, which also you need to look at. Um, across being able to deliver this with speed. So, you know, I really believe being able to pivot and do things quickly um, is the key to unlocking the capability um, in the uncertain future. I know we're not here to talk about what we do, but one of the things that this reminds me of is we just sort of finished a project with the big amusement park company that's global. And they, sorry, it's not based in the US. And they were running um, sort of their AI algorithms to predict how many people would show up at the park using a cloud-based solution. And it was taking them two days to generate the solution, which is not very agile actually, because you have to you know, plan for food and staff and so on. And we were able with some of my graduate students to bring it down to you know, 15 minutes. Uh, it's called the human in the loop approach and uh, where you have the human sort of partner in sort of the feature set designed for, for AI. But you know, those are all examples of sort of agility, you know, rapid response, but you have to have the data and you have to have sort of the infrastructure uh, in place. Uh, switching, not really switching gears, but sort of delving deeper into one. Um, uh, actually, before I do that, if, for those of you who've got questions, please feel free to start submitting questions to the Q&A. We're about six minutes out from questions. Um, you know, we're noticing, you know, initially uh, when I spoke to some CIOs, they were worried about you know, budgets being cut and, you know, in some companies, certainly the ones that are hurting, the budgets are being cut. But what we're actually hearing is a different story a lot, which is um, digital transformation is accelerating because, uh, you, you know, you look at, for example, online groceries and how quickly uh, those companies have, have grown. And, you know, today I was looking at the companies that I've seen big run-ups in market value, and a lot of them are tech company. So we're seeing sort of this, this whole push towards acceleration. Um, and some of it is that executives are sort of lowering sort of the question, the number of the barriers to implementation, if you will. Uh, how do you leverage this sort of this culture that we've somehow developed in a crisis and make sure it continues for the future, in the future? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think it's interesting as I look at this, because I always th think that technology is a lot more about the psychology sometimes than the technology, which is how do you get people to adapt 
the changes into new ways of working. Um, and that's always been really hard. And, and I remember, you know, rolling out some initiatives around collaboration for, um, you know, virtual meetings and email and getting people to come to go look at the way they can do productivity. And I remember we needed to give away cupcakes or okay. give, you know, one week was cupcakes and the next week was, you know, we'll give you ice cream if you show up. And now, uh, you know, it's just become, you don't need to uh, coerce people or bribe them to come in. It's like, they've got two minutes to start a meeting. So they're gonna use what's in front of them and they're gonna work it out. So it's kind of just, you know, allowed a lot of this change to be a lot more smooth in terms of people willing to change the ways that they're working because they have to, there's no other choice. And they have, you know, a decision, they have an airplane that they have to turn around or they have, you know, a customer that they need to speak to. Um, and, uh, you know, the speed has made everybody just kind of embrace the change. So I'm finding that really interesting and it is a really great pivot point to say, actually now we can use this opportunity to digitize things more quickly. So, you know, governments and other organizations have never been more open to, you know, docu signs and things that yes. allow you to do things more virtually. Whereas in the past, you know, I still remember like in some areas of the business, you had to legally send a fax yeah. um, to get things done, you know, an email, was or electronic communication was not um, okay. Things like digital identity. We've been talking about that for a long time, but a lot of what companies are thinking about and we're all thinking about right now is, you know, is there a next wave? How can we prepare for whatever comes our way in the future? So as you think about those things, you need to digitize almost every single part of your business. Um, so I think that the appetite is now there. And I think the other part, which has helped meet it halfway too, is the fact that um, as we look at things that need to take hours to implement versus years to implement, um, we're also kind of back to the theme of Agile, which is how can you do this um, very quickly? Um, the one thing though that I do um, want to call out as well is, is that we have to be thoughtful about things like bias. So one of the things, you know, right now all of us are at home, um, but there will be a point of time where some of us are in the office and some of us are at home. And I think we need to think of biases um, as well across that, which you don't come into the, you know, people in the office kind of know what's going on versus everybody at home doesn't. So, so we need to be careful now in this world that we'll, we'll start to move into, which is how do you make sure everybody is inclusive and has the same information and that we don't default back to kind of the way we operated um, before. Um, so, so I think that, that people are now open to this not perfect solution, but something that works, they can start to use and then start to improve upon as things move forward. Yeah, that's really, it's a problem that I think we wish we have because it'll signal a result, uh, sort of a return to some kind of normality, but it is, uh, it is going to be a phased return. And you know, to your point about sort of how people embrace some of this, I have to say, and I have to point out, because even at the university, we've been debating online education for over a decade now. And, you know, there's a, like you talked about, the, the, you know, the, how you sort of, in quotes, bribe somebody to do something that they're not used to doing or it's a new thing. Every single professor across every single university embrace this because we wanted to make sure that the students were not hurt by this. And so all of those sort of internal barriers and divisions and, hey, you need to incentivize me, all fell away. I mean, and to turn that thing around in two weeks is, is mind boggling and universities pulled it off. Um, we have a lot of questions from our audience, Susan. So I'm gonna sort of pivot to, I, I can read them out to you if you like. Actually, I'll read them out so that everybody can hear them. So there's a question from Tim Johnson. Can you speak to how processes and people have changed or resisted it. Tech gives you the flexibility that people have to see the value of using it. And then there's the process that must be dealt with. Yeah, so, I mean, and, and that's kind of what I referred to in the change management. Usually when you're doing a technology project, you know, there's a certain amount that, you know, the actual technology and then testing, but the broad majority of the time is training process and the people. Um, and so what I found is um, some of the things that we did was, um, you know, you offer these help desks now that are more virtual and that people can speak to, you know, 24 by seven. Um, we also, um, 
We also looked at, you know, it makes a big statement when the leaders are doing the same thing as everybody else. So, you know, in the past, you know, the leaders would have, you know, executive assistants that would help them with a lot of things. Well, I don't have an executive assistant at my home and neither do most of the other CEOs as well. So you've kind of had to fend for yourself um, as well. So I think that that process and in, in doing it yourself has also allowed people to say, oh, when the leader is doing it and they can kind of get through it, then I can as well. So there's a little bit of this um, leadership through example and the leadership shadow that you are placing. And I think that's really important in the process and the people management too, is that um, is that people feel like, okay, we just got to get on and do this. And even, you know, my boss is doing it. It really helps in the change um, process and the people process as well. So you, I don't know if I answered the question, but. This is sort of a specific sort of question. How do you define digital capabilities? I think I use that term more than you, but I'm going to throw the question to you. And mm -hmm. how do you assess your digital capabilities given how quickly they change? I actually think, I think of digital capabilities in two ways. One way is the actual one, like AI and cloud and, you know, computing and everything we've been doing for a long time. But I also think there's digital capabilities in terms of what I would call, um, I'll call them leadership attributes, for lack of a better word, which is um, being able to quickly change the way you do things. So, you know, in, in, at P&G as an example, we used to have... A, uh, you know, these things called fact books, and they were like this thick, and they were like probably six point font, which had, you know, every um, uh, SKU we had, and every product, and their index versus year ago in terms of sales, growth, revenue, etc, dollar share, wallet share, etc. Um, and that was kind of the way people worked is they had these books, they knew how to find things out, they knew that that was kind of the secret to their success. Well, to me, the digital capabilities saying, you know what, you, you don't need to do that anymore. The computer can do that. Your capability here is the insights that you're driving across all of that. And then how can you use the tool to spread out those insights? So in the past, the insights were, well, whoever happened to be in the meeting would hear what you had to say. Well, now if you have a place where everything's published all at once, this is actually what we used at P&G too. You could get the CEO or the other leaders to comment on it. And it was a lot more transparent um, and visual. So this, this idea of being comfortable with transparency, with mm -hmm. um, embracing new ways of working, of, um, I call it, you know, reverse mentoring is hearing, you know, those people that are coming new straight out of university, how they've been doing things, how they've been managing things, how they communicate with people. So to me, you know, we've been talking about, you know, how do you pivot quickly? How do you build resilience? All of these, I call those digital capabilities as well. And I think that's what everybody needs. And, and I remember as well when, um, when I was at P&G and the CEO, you know, we had all these courses of how to teach Excel and how to, you know, do Word and everything. And at one point in time, it was like, well, these are the basic skill sets we need people to have. To, to be yep. in the company. I mean, you're not gonna train somebody on how to use a telephone or how to use your, your phone. It should be A, you know, this is the digital capability in terms of the tech people, the programming so easy that it's intuitive. But on the other side is, you know, you should feel comfortable being able to learn on the fly as well versus having, you know, a three week training course on how to use your iPhone. <laughs> um, Carol Fawcett has a question about, um, why have you separated IT and you haven't done it because I think you inherited this title. Like why, why are IT and data analytics separated? Aren't they the, don't, isn't it just one team under the same umbrella? Oh, it's one team. Yeah. So um, it is one team, um, which is great uh, because, and the reason why you would say, well, why wouldn't you just call it technology uh, perhaps um, is because in many organizations, they are not together at all. In fact, my experience would be that's, um, the exception versus the rule. And uh, so we put them both together. So the data, so I am to provide a data analytics capability, which is not just, I'll call it the technology, but the insights and people that drive that at scale across the Boeing company. And that is powered by the technology, but yep. it is a um, solution that goes hand in hand. Now here's a question from a mutual friend of ours, um, Ravi's Simham Butler, 
now at Google, when previously at United. Um, just congratulating you. It's going to be a hard question, I know. <laughs> it's actually a pretty easy question. It's a very specific question. Uh, when can we realistically expect AR-based aircraft maintenance and, uh, and maintenance training to become a reality to help them these teams become more productive, faster, smarter? Oh, well, we're working on that right now. I mean, it's, um, it's one of our big priorities. And if you listen to Dr. Hyslip, who's an amazing um, leader, uh, and actually he led R&D. So this is his brainchild across it. So I, you know, I'm not going to give any dates or anything like that, but we're working on it already. And in some cases, we've got some of it very much um, being used as well. Um, one of my colleagues, Leonard Lane, has a question. He says, you know, he sees, he, he works for, uh, beyond teaching for us, works for sort of an Asian uh, company in the learning organization. And says, how do you sort of also train people to unlearn? He thinks the world is moving past VUCA. Uh, and sort of unlearning becomes really important as well. Uh, so how do you sort of encourage people to give up the practices of the past? Um, well, I, I, uh, one of the tools that I find really helpful is the design thinking idea, which is yeah. putting yourself in the position of your customer, um, you know, whichever way that is, because that and really, you know, you have to kind of, Maybe it's, it's um, more than unlearn. It's kind of, you've got to be a blank slate. No preconceived notions. Like you've got to just not come in with a hypothesis, but rather you've got to come in with a blank slate and really observe people um, and what they're doing. Because if you come in with this hypothesis, you're, you're going to miss things. And I think that's probably, you know, what your colleague is referring to as unlearn as well, which is, you know, we have a certain biases and the way things are done and the way things will work. And then we don't leave ourselves open to the fact that the world has moved on or things have changed. And to say, actually, what worked before is not going to work anymore. So I think if you always peel it back to observing, watching people, what they're doing, letting them talk to you. I, I remember again at P&G, this is absolutely fantastic. And I, I get it. I would ask everybody to do it. It's a great learning is our CEO what um, he would do is they would do these visits um, and they wouldn't just do store visits. They would do visits to the homes. And in this case, uh, the one that always sticks out at me because I've worked in Mexico as well, is they would go visit the most humblest person in their home, the CEO of Procter & Gamble, A.G. Lackley at that point in time, would go in and the woman would explain to him how she washed her clothes, what she would do every day. You know, if you can think of this kind of unlearning concept, I'm sure AG probably knew how to wash his clothes. Um, and he, you know, um, probably knew how to wash them in a very fancy apparatus. But relearning how this woman would do it, or, um, you know, we did something similar with um, how they wash their dishes in Africa, et cetera. And watching and observing and looking at how these people use your products. I think is a great tool to address that. Yeah, we have time for one last question. So I'm gonna to go to, uh, my apologies to those that we couldn't get to, uh, but I'll get a question by, uh, uh, from Shafali Dua, which is, can you share more about your communication? How is your communication strategy is changing, which you sort of alluded to already? Uh, and how do you keep your customers, employees, partners, vendors all engaged uh, as well? Yeah. Yeah, really you know important. what, it's, yeah, it's a great question. And I found that in order to receive radical transparency, you need to give radical transparency. So what I found is that if you're just going to be vanilla in all of this, you know, you're not going to get the outcomes that you want. What I found is you really have to put yourself out there in terms of sharing things about either yourself or what you're seeing or what you're thinking in a way that is very respectful, of course. Um, so not that I know it all or I've seen it all, but this is kind of what I'm seeing or what I'm observing. Help me understand, is that what you're seeing? How are you feeling about things? So you really almost need to ask these questions because I can't tell how you're feeling about something. Um, and I haven't known you enough to know, you know, if your eyebrow goes this way versus that way, you really didn't like my idea. So I have to ask you, 
And the only way you're going to be willing to tell me that you didn't really like my idea or, you know, you didn't understand it is me putting myself out there and being, um, being transparent and being humble to say, actually, I'm sorry, I didn't really understand that. Or, you know, take me back to the 101 version of this, please. Um, so that I can understand it. So I think you need to give to receive. Well, with that, uh, thank you so much, Susan, for joining us today. And a special thank you to our attendees. We're just delighted so many of you joined us at our first live event. We'd love to have you continue to engage with us. Uh, please reach out to us, any one of our team, with your suggestions and recommendations. For the CIO Roundtable members who are on this uh, webinar, uh, we're now switching over to the CIO Roundtable meeting, so, and you should all have a link in your calendar, and we'll see you in a few minutes. But again, to the broader audience, thank you so much, and a real sort of special shout out to Susan. Thank you so much for answering all of our questions with such thought uh, and care. We appreciate it, and uh, thank you again. Uh, goodbye, everybody. Thank you.